I love how Jesus puts all of this into perspective at the end of this passage. He highlights 12 defiling sins. He moves beyond the Corbin issue. He moves beyond the food issue and says, I'll tell you what, this is what defiles a man. And he says, look in your hearts. And so I would ask each of us as we close, I'm just going to say just a very few things about these, these, uh, th this list of, of defiling sins that Jesus gives here. But I would ask that as we close uh, that we would uh, do so in a spirit of self-examination and penitence, praying that God would expose our sin to us. Let me warn you that this uh, will get ugly Right? These sins are meant to be... This, descri this description of these sins is meant to be ugly. That's the point. Defiling. But that's exactly Christ's point. Our ugliness comes from within. And I would also ask you to endure the ugliness of this list of sin because the good news comes as we understand these sins. So first of all, Jesus says evil thoughts. And, and some of these may not be in the same order as you have them in your pew Bible. But Jesus highlights evil thoughts. Let me just say this. If you knew all of the evil thoughts of the person you're sitting next to, you probably wouldn't like them anymore. If you could get inside their head, you would see that we're, we're so filled with evil thoughts. Now, not everybody sees these things. Uh, but, uh, but it'd be difficult to trust each other if we knew the evil thoughts that were going through our heads. Our minds were created to be creative, but after the fall they tend to create evil. So our minds are, are a factory of, of, of evil thoughts, as Jesus says here. Now Jesus also mentions three uh, sins that fall under the category of, uh, of sexual sins. And I just want, to notice, want you to notice that that's showing a certain emphasis. Three sexual sins Jesus mentions here. Alright, so he says these are very significant in terms of those things that defile us. One of the things he mentions is adulteries. Adulteries. Now when Jesus uses the word adultery, we know that he's not merely talking about sleeping with another man's wife or sleeping with another woman's husband. Because he understands, as he says in, in the Sermon on the Mount, that even, even looking at a wife or a husband with lust, uh, undressing that person in our minds and having uh, illicit thoughts about someone else's husband or someone else's wife is adultery. Uh, who in here is not an adulterer then? With that definition. Jesus also uses this term lewdness. Lewdness, that is lust. Uh, or uh, failing to bridle our sensual passions. Letting our minds run wild with, with, with sexually deviant thoughts. Lewdness has to do with giving free play to perverse impulses. Right? If we were to communicate the lewdness of our minds to our friends around us, they wouldn't trust us anymore. Fornications, says Jesus. Now this is sort of a catch-all term. Uh, sexual deviancy in its most general form. The word that Jesus uses here is porneia, uh, which you, you hear pornography in that word. The same word from which we get our word pornography. And this word teaches us that uh, human sexuality is designed by God to be expressed within the context of a marriage between one woman and one man. Jesus says, everything else is porneia. You see, how, you see how broad that is? Sexual sins committed with oneself or committed with another person, if not in the context of, uh, of, of marriage between one man and one woman, porneia, fornications. Next, Jesus gives a, a number of sins that, that specifically hurt others. And, and we see, of course, that, that all sins hurt others. But Jesus says there's a number that are specifically directed against our neighbor. He uses uh, the first of which is murders. Murders. And again, Jesus understands murder not only as the taking of a life. You see, we tend to define uh, sin in, in, in a very extreme case. Right? Murder is, is, is taking one's life without cause. Jesus says, no, speaking with anger, undue anger to your brother is murderer. It is murder. 
don't raise your hands. Uh, but is anyone here a murderer? Right? According to Christ's definition, we're murderers. Thefts, he says, that is taking to ourselves what rightly belongs to others. Deceit, uh, using trickery to benefit ourselves. Blasphemy. Uh, blasphemy is, is injurious speech, using our mouths to hurt someone, to malign someone. Often the term is used to refer to the way we talk about God. Uh, but it also encompasses the way that we talk to and about each other. Blasphemy. Christ then lists three defiling attitudes. And this is, uh, of course, also very wise of Christ. Uh, because he's not just talking about the really bad things that we do. Isn't sin often defined as those really bad things that we do? Jesus here is ta also talking about attitudes. Anybody have an attitude? No, you don't have to raise your hand for that. Jesus says we all have attitude. Here's, here's three attitudes. Envy. Envy. What is envy? Well, envy is uh, having displeasure when you see what someone else has. Having displeasure with what someone else has. Jesus says we should rejoice with those who rejoice, with those who have, have much. But we are naturally inclined to envy, to actually be angry and upset when someone else has something good. Envy, or an evil eye as it's here in the New King James. Covetousness, that is desiring what someone else, not only being angry over what someone else has, but even desiring what someone else, is, what someone else has. Jesus says that's covetousness. That's something filthy that comes out of your heart. Or pride, another term that Jesus uses, uses here, thinking too highly of yourself. And then Jesus gives two sort of summary terms to sort of describe the, the decor of our hearts. He says, he uses the term wickedness and foolishness. Wickedness and foolishness. Anybody want to follow your heart? That's, that's the, the sort of buzz phrase. Say, just follow your heart. Wickedness, foolishness, and all the other attributes that we've listed. Jesus' conclusion is rather stunning here. And I hope as we examine ourselves, we, we feel uh, the, 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 the power of these terms that, that Jesus is using here. It's stunning because... Remember how this discussion started? How this confrontation started? The Pharisees said, your disciples don't wash your hands properly. Now what has Jesus done? He said, forget about your hands. Forget about these rituals. What you eat. Who you rub up against. Hand rinsing is the least of your problems says Jesus. What is He doing? He's, he's drawing our attention from all of the externals and focusing our attention to our hearts. The solution must begin with our hearts. When we read this list, I hope that we're feeling naked and exposed because we realize that these things are true of us. And so what we see here is rather than running around as the Pharisees were doing here, traveling all the way from Jerusalem to point at the disciples and say, you're not washing your hands properly. We stop running around and focus on ourselves and say, Lord, I have a filthy heart. Of course, you know that. But I agree with you that I have a filthy heart. You see my heart and are still willing to forgive me. You see, it's so important to understand our sin as God does, as Jesus does. Real Purity, something the Pharisees ostensibly sought, real purity, is not only possible, but it's also promised. Did you catch that in our call to worship? Real purity is not only possible, it's also promised by God. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, though your hearts are ugly, though all of these defiling things pour out of your hearts, you can be as white 